I'm going to tell you today is more relevant coming from my life and also from recent professional experience. And I hope I can be of practical utility to everyone. While the topic seems very dire, it comes from what I've gone through literally in the last six months and many of my colleagues have gone through that. And it comes from a real place. So in many ways, I may be emotionally and sentimentally in a very different place. Uh, and I'd like you to have the benefit of that. So the broad altruism comes from, you know, a personal as well as a collective love that we all have for our country. And I believe that our individual safety finally adds up to our national safety. So if we really love our God, we should love our country, our in countrymen, and thus we make a much better and safer nation. This picture is taken from the Time magazine a few months ago, and it shows you many nice pictures and photographs of individuals. And if you've read this issue, you realize that each and every one were a casualty to the uh, COVID pandemic. And I'm going to actually highlight one such person at the bottom left. And this gentleman is the person who's actually been recognized as the whistleblower in Wuhan, a Chinese ophthalmologist, Dr. Li Wen Liang, who's now become famous, actually, sadly, after his death, for actually highlighting the pandemic and informing people on social media circles about its danger. Uh, sadly, he became one of the first victims in the medical field to this. So this fear came to us somewhere in the month of April in a very realistic fashion. And today we actually, I speak from a real situation where I have to be comfortable, I have to be, you know, uh, contextual to my risk that I face every day. I walk out of house, uh, out of my home and into a medical setting. And we now know that more than 200 doctors have actually died in India due to COVID and at least uh, six or more in the national capital region itself. And I'm personally aware of about 12 nurses who also died in the Delhi area. So this is a living real risk. And how do I cope with it? Not just uh, medically, but emotionally, uh, mentally, and uh, spiritually is the key. And this does not just come with a health risk. It comes with a complete ecosystem of problems. You come with hospital staff getting paid lower pays now. The effort is intensive because of personal protective equipment and safety protocols. Hospital investments in safety hardware as well as protocols are much higher. There's a fearful population that you have to deal with, especially a patient population and the immediate family, a potentially hostile media, and of course, bureaucratic challenges to name a few. So this is actually in the operation theater of one of the first COVID positive patients that I was operating in. As you can see, everyone's in a moon suit and the threat is very, very real and continuous. And so thank you once again for your prayers. I know many people have been praying. This is me and my team operating on a lady who came with a life-threatening emergency and we had to go in. There's no backing away from this. Everybody from the nurses to doctors, the anesthetists, technicians have to moon suit up and do the need for. Now, all this makes you realize that you are mortal. Your life is finite. And there are very simple ways in which you can realize the pandemic has been won for the medical field. And we realize, as somebody has very, in, of course, in a fictional article, that we all actually are not bodies that have souls here. We actually have souls to whom bodies have been gifted. And if you have this little change, but big perspective difference, you actually can make a lot more sense of your life and the afterlife. So while all of us comforted ourselves with this scripture bit, you know, it does very well, Psalm 91, Psalm 46, and Psalm 121, to name a few, and Psalm 23, you actually need far more than that. And so you have to really dig deep within yourself and within your faith, and you realize often how little or none of it you have. But the one thing you get a little acutely aware of is this. Like Elijah could hear the still small voice. I think if you stay still enough and stay silent enough, 
you will hear God speaking through the virus, through the pandemic, through the lockdown. And this is what we heard in our perspective and that we'd like to share with you, not just individually, but also collectively. The truth by nature is painful. The truth by nature is inconvenient, awkward, and often has a stench around it. So this is a global warning, not just a regional or a national one. So a lot of the things that I'm going to tell you are very relevant worldwide. Most of us are not naive people, but we believe. We believe other human beings, especially those who approximate to us, those in the family, community, in our professional circles, and also in our social circles, because we believe they are telling us the truth. And this often holds true for national and regional leaders and maybe even the media to some extent these days. So we may come away very surprised when we find out that what we've been told is not true or is not completely true. So the first item to which I would highlight or I would like to bring your attention today is how do you and I find out what is true? What is the truth in a given situation, a context, or a message? Because this is really important. I mean, how do you believe what you read in the Bible to be true? How do you believe what I am saying to be true? How do you believe the preacher on the Sunday morning to be saying whatever he says or he, he, he says to be true? So you have to do your homework, and that's what this talk is about. Please remember, the error often doesn't lie with the speaker, but the error may lie with us subjectively, because we often are persuaded to believe what we would like to believe, what is convenient to our situation and to our personality or to our you know, given scenario. And we are often more comfortable with a reassuring lie. So I'm going to place this little few graphics just to highlight how to catch the truth. And the one that I really worry about is truth that is twisted, not necessarily intentionally. Truth that is twisted just a little bit. And this, frankly, is a lie. And thus, you know, you really have to be on the edge for anything and everything that we face today and check it out. Double check it, triple check it, counter check it, and find out what the truth is or what likely is to be in the neighborhood of the truth. And to start with, I would say, please do have your strong opinions about everything. But you really are not entitled to your facts. And we will try to place to you some of them today. And especially when you get fearful, and I know people have been fearful. The elderly have been fearful. Uh, people with comorbidity have been fearful during the pandemic, and rightly so. I know how worried uh, my parents were, the elders were in our neighborhood. We try to do our bit to be objective with that. The first thing is if you have an action plan, fear starts to recede. So we'll, I'll try to give it to you both as a personal medical advice and also at a personal, call it emotional or spiritual assist. Please check everything that I'm telling you with your independent sources or resources. I'm only responsible for what I'm telling you, not really responsible for what you understand. I hope you gather the difference and the distinction there. So primarily in the unlockdown, in the phase that we are, how do you and I keep ourselves fear, uh, uh, safe? The first thing is you and I have to fight misinformation or disinformation. As I said, misinformation may not be uh, intentional. The simple thing is to double check with authorities and independent sources until you're absolutely or reasonably sure that you're dealing with the correct information or that you don't know. It's not bad or sad to say that I do not know. And that is something that I often resort to in the surgical or medical field if I don't know something about it. And please be aware about your stress levels. Get some emotional help if it's something major. And yes, you and I know that fake news, especially on social media, travels much, much faster. 
someone said it travels about six times faster than the truth. So anything that looks hot and is spreading very quickly and is too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. Double check that out. And in fact, the WHO has dedicated a page on its uh, website for busting myths. And please do visit it. And two good other sources are the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare uh, and again, the WHO main site. And you should check these out before you uh, resort to or plan anything in your workspace or your personal space. This is one of many pandemics, as this graphic will show you. We seem to get at least one major pandemic every 10 years. In fact, exactly about 10 years ago, the editorial from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, the National Medical Journal of India, actually warned us of a pandemic coming in November 2009. And exactly about 10 years after that, we had this pandemic. And please be warned that this is not the last one. All right. So some of the common lessons will hold true now and subsequently. So listening to this little talk will probably be of benefit to you and your family later on in life. Now, I know I'm dealing with a grim subject, but I think the key area that all of us are worried is you and I don't want to die. Simple as that. Sadly, India over the last one week has had the maximum number of deaths worldwide and we've overtaken the United States. This is from the WHO's website today. But please also be aware that the number one and two causes of death worldwide are cardiovascular diseases like heart attacks and strokes and cancers. All right. So these two are the number one. And sadly, the third is COVID today. If you look at the top five, you'll find it very interesting that suicide is up there. And that is something that those of you at Open Up and Glove can actually address this more objectively and through the church. So this statistical representation out here may come as a surprise to many of you. The number one and two causes of death worldwide are cardiovascular diseases and cancers. Number three is COVID, followed closely by HIV AIDS, and surprise, surprise, by suicide. So that is something we really have to take attention to. This, as I mentioned before, is not the first pandemic and certainly not the first coronavirus. It's a seventh and is likely to be more of them. The nomenclature is there below for you and most of your experts on this probably by now. Now, all of us are concerned, how risky is this? If you compare this with your seasonal flu, it is, yes, anywhere from two to five times more deadlier, and yes, maybe twice as more infective or contagious. So it has to be taken seriously, and I think we've done well as a country overall. The median incubation period is about five days, and that's after which some people develop fever and symptoms, and then a few of them may progress to a much more severe phase of disease, but most people actually do well. This is a graphical representation of, this blue line represents how far you can catch the virus in your nasopharyngeal swabs, and the dotted lines are your antibody tests, which come up a few days or weeks later on, and hopefully last few months, if not a lifetime, and there is now doubt about it, but we will wait for research. The commonest symptoms, as you must be very well aware of, are fever, fatigue, cough, shortness of breath, and this differentiates it from other illnesses. You may even have severe headache, sore throat, even diarrhea. So an acute gastroenteritis may even herald a COVID infection. The good news, if you can call it good news, is that only about 3% in India, by statistics, actually fall dangerously ill. The majority, about 95 to 97%, actually do very well, although about 10 to 15% would fall ill requiring hospitalization. 
but 80 to 90 percent would get away and here is the catch that most people who fall COVID positive are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic and these are the people that go around spreading the disease and thus the logic of lockdown social distancing wearing a mask and washing your hands now these are taken from common who and ministry of health and family welfare guidelines all of us are very aware about the benefits of wearing masks maintaining distance washing our hands frequently maintaining respiratory etiquette and avoiding crowds a special note for the elderly above 65 because they are more prone for any illness especially those of the infectious sort children are largely being spared the disease but there is now growing concern in young children so especially those under 10 you must seek medical attention if they get fever cough or breathlessness pregnant ladies and especially those who have comorbidities such as hypertension heart disease diabetes obesity or those being treated for cancer so these are the high risk people and they must take care of themselves or others in the family must ensure that they get prompt medical attention if they develop any of the symptoms there's a lot about workspace engineering i'm going to stress on only one because that's the key one air quality is premium your air conditioning can probably kill you if you are in a recycled atmosphere please ensure a fresh intake inlet and also a continuous outlet or exit for the air from the room maintain a temperature about 24 to 30 degrees celsius and a relative humidity about 40 to 70 percent so this is the one that i'm going to stress on the rest can be picked up from the internet or i could forward this presentation to you now a few highlights for personal protection wearing a mask is not a fashion statement or a matter of concern for i mean telling others that you're concerned about them it is mandatory you've got to wear your mask for your safety as well as for others safety so even if one person was not wearing a mask you actually could increase the transmission probability by up to 70 percent you reduce it to about one percent if you if everyone wears it social distancing idly two meters if not at least six feet please sleep deprivation is the number one cause for immune suppression worldwide you need at least eight hours of sleep well-timed sleep from nine o'clock onwards maybe till early morning about four or five you are going to laugh at me for this but i laugh back even at myself because this is where we suffer as urbanites and as modern people you have to cut down screen time and in inculcate a disciplined sleep habit exercise don't overdo it you don't have to go to the gym but a simple walking duration of half an hour to one hour at minimum apart from your daily activities is mandatory for your physical health a highlight for the elderly all the above ensure that they get their medicines on time the nutrition on time avoid visitors at their homes make them stay home avoid going out and postpone their elective surgeries like a cataract or a joint replacement i would say definitely for the next six months or till you get medical and surgical clearance and if they develop a symptom of covid or non-covid diseases please get them to the hospital asap as soon as possible there's no virtue treating it at home because the risk of treating a medical problem or surgical problem at home is much more than catching the disease in a hospital which is much better engineered these days for preventing covid transmission a note about all these medicines please remember from hydroxychloroquine to remdesivir to tocilizumab to convalescent plasma to plasma exchange therapy these are all investigational if not off label by that i mean we don't have dedicated proof in this and as physicians i'll come down to another slide to explain how this works 
So when we advise a treatment, it usually means it has a safety profile and proven efficacy. None of these drugs, none of these interventions have proven efficacy and safety in a medically certifiable way. They are being used in a distress situation. So you need to understand that. And that's how we base our evidence-based medicine. When we come to you, there's a certain way to do it. There's a certain protocol. And so let me start with the one that we're all excited about, but we don't know. How soon can we have an effective and safe COVID vaccine? Probably I would say safe and effective. Let me underline this fact to you. Any credible research and licensing process takes about 10 to 15 years. So you're going to ask me, what are the politicians telling us by cutting red tape? You can cut red tape, but that does not cut down effective research. You need phase one, two, and phase three trials. Each of them take years to do. So if you ask me personally, you maybe talk to me in 2022 at the earliest, I'll give you some news. But before that, everything is speculation. And thus, it's worth taking a little pause here when you listen to any statement made by non-medical people. Please remember they're under pressure, so are we. So when anyone, especially a political leader, makes a statement, remember they're competing with biology and usually biology wins. Please ensure that you've got your insurance up to date you have your premiums paid, and if you're taking a COVID-19 specific insurance policy, make sure, make sure you read the fine print. Those of you who are employers or in leadership positions, you need to have a COVID-19 protocol and plan for your workspace. There is uh, resources from the WHO as well as from the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Even some of them have been updated today, and you need to make it empowered, contextual, and with a quick uh, you know, return in the cycle so you can take action quickly. Please also address legal issues, especially relating to illness, to sickness, work safety, absence from work and travel. And of course, check your corporate insurance if you're in charge of a big organization. And yes, please be absolutely transparent with your staff be unambiguous in your communication, ensure a two-way communication, educate routinely and regularly your staff about everything and check with the authorities and official recommendations. And yes, make a available personal protective equipment for some, for instance, somebody at the front desk needs to be given face masks, N95 if you ask me, as well as face shields because they are under real risk. Now, we're all there for you, but please remember that you are the first line. We are the last line of defense, right? You are the ones dealing with everything on, in community as well as workplace. Please ensure a compassionate uh, you know, disposition when you deal with people who especially have recovered or having COVID. And if you, I'm gonna sum my medical advice by this. Do not worry unnecessarily. Most people, about 80% will have no symptoms of little symptoms. Follow the directives of the government or regional authorities or your employer. Follow SMS, that's my acronym for social distancing, wearing a mask, hand sanitization, in workspace as well as in public places. This is an absolutely mandatory requirement. And if you have fever, you have a persistent cough, and especially if you have difficulty in breathing, seek immediate medical attention. And do not please start any medication on your own. All medications, all chemicals have side effects. The last bit I'm gonna to come to now. As a church, both in the organized as well as outside the organized church, we need to get our act together. Yes, pray. I think Mr. David Sudan and uh, this is Mega been doing a wonderful job leading the Open Up initiative over the last few months. I've been a beneficiary of that myself. Besides following uh, statutory guidelines and requirements, 
find ways to strengthen the community. I think Glove is an interesting initiative in that direction. But I would say start also the long-term conversation about how we can contribute to making healthcare in our country more meaningful, more relevant, more responsive, more responsible. It's a big topic, but I believe the single community that can start this is ours because we are God endowed, God gifted. Most importantly, we need to understand our responsibility towards the environment. This is a planet sized problem, not a small one. God gave us the express responsibility of tending to the Garden of Eden. And look what we've done to it. Today, about 15 fires are raging in California, and there's a picture of the Los, Los Angeles area, uh, and you can see the forest fire smoke there. This affects the environment. Look at the satellite image of India between 2019 and 2020. During the lockdown in Delhi, we actually breathed very easy because our pollution levels for the first time in about a decade came under the upper level of what is acceptable. Does the unlockdown mean going back to the past? We lose about more than a million people in India every year to pollution. I know we committed to the government to public interest litigations. This is our job. Do you know that about five to 17 years of your lifespan are taken away and most of us live in highly polluted areas in the world? Premature death. We're already seeing that around us. Heart attacks, arrhythmias, aggravated asthma, damaged lung function, and increased respiratory complaints. All these are because of pollution, even if you didn't believe it earlier on. You need to be well informed. And this is a fifth leading cause of mortality worldwide. And if you doubt it, please look at some other publications. I can forward them to you. So in the top five is air pollution, you know, in terms of what reduces our life expectancy. I'm already seeing increased number of children dying of cancer in big metros. We, we see that in hospitals. You may not see that in communities. So put together rapid urbanization, globalization, and global warming. That, apart from other reasons, are the cause for which natural disasters at a global level are going to become more common. So the actions and inactions in the local level has global impact these days. I worded this because I couldn't get anybody else to say it. You and I cannot have a pill-sized solution for a planet-sized disaster. And you and I need to start acting now. In fact, the United Nations a year ago said that we just have about 11 years before irreversible damage has taken place in our climate. This is the UN telling us, right? How many of us know about it? So I believe in many areas, the time has already run out. It reminds me of what God told Jonah to tell the Ninevites. Nineveh at that time was the biggest city on the planet. It took three days to take a walk around it. It was the uh, capital of the kingdom of Assyria. I mean, God sent the prophet Jonah to an enemy empire to warn them. That's part of the reason why he ran away. So this dire warning, 11 years, 10 years, this is not a joke. And I hope we can understand that coming, you know, when we look at scripture about warnings. Now funneling all this down, about 25,000 people die in India every day. Isn't that a huge opportunity for us to make a difference? Why so? Does this look familiar? I hope not. Will this be the last thing you will see in this life? I hope not. About 97% of people who die in the West die in an intensive care or in a hospital. There is a movement now to shift that home. The bottom line is how good is the quality at the end of your life? 
Someone did a study a few years ago and they found that we figure in the bottom 15. This is a huge opportunity for improvement. So I know I'm coming to you from the pandemic perspective and context, but especially in a time where mortality or death is common in a country as big as ours, we have a huge challenge and opportunity for help. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, the quality is poor and that's a combination mainly because of the lack of awareness of effective palliative care, which is available actually, although not as widely as we would like it to be, and the denial of effective pain relief. When I say pain relief, I mean total pain. By total pain, I not just mean physical pain because let's say cancer, which is spread, but also because of emotional pain, spiritual pain and mental pain that for instance, a prisoner or his family member face, right? So these are some of the reasons why people are in pain towards the end of their life. And the list is long and we need to address it. And I think the only community sensitive enough to address it is ours. Although many people are doing it, Many of my friends from other walks and faiths are here, and I am really encouraged by their encouragement, their individual, their own community initiatives. And I think that has been more a sense of family. So we really have to aim for what is called the concept of a good death. You know, it's about adding quality to what's remaining in your life rather than adding days to that. This is a summary. I really can't deal with this uh, in the span of time we have, but I can take qu questions during the Q&A session. And this is actually a journey. In fact, from the time you have a life threatening disease that's been told to you to the year after or the years after someone's bereavement, you know, the family needs help. So from preventive care, to palliative care, modern medical care is now stretched across this continuum. And for instance, when you look at, let's say, gut cancer or large bowel cancer, primordial or very basic essential prevention is preventing obesity, maintaining physical activity. Primary prevention would mean eating the stuff that you shouldn't be eating, like red meats, stop smoking, avoid excessive alcohol, Secondary prevention would be after the age of 45, ensure you get a colonoscopy at least every three or four years. And if they find a polyp, make sure it's taken out or get treated accordingly. And tertiary prevention is the early detection of the fact that you may not be living long enough and doing the necessary things. So modern medical care is stretched across this and you and I have a big part to play, not just in the first three categories, but also the last one. So actually in this meeting, we have the privilege, I think of Dr. Stanley McCartan being there. He's the lead author for writing the end of life care policy for the dying in India. And uh, he's written along with Dr. Naveen Salins, who at that time was the uh, faculty at the Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai. And I think today he's in Manipal Hospital in Bengaluru and a whole lot of other experts and that often that's come from his personal and professional commitment to ensuring an excellent um, quality of life towards the end of life. I've given his contact at the left bottom. And today, this is actually a science, not just an art. You actually have written out what the principles of a good death is and how the decision making process comes on towards the end. This may be a very distressing topic, but believe me, not addressing it is far more distressing and painful. So that is the key. And you really see it in the eyes and lives of people who have been benefited with it, the survivors, the people who've survived. So in fact, now the industry and the commercial uh, organizations in our country have come together and actually put a five point action plan and gone public with it. Fiki has gone with it. And at the bottom right, I mentioned that the Christian Medical Association of India 
has a 16-hour training module for church members and church volunteers, which is a WHO World Health Organization grade course and is certified by the Indian Association of Palliative Care. So you're getting almost a professional level certificate. You're getting a professional level certificate if you volunteer. So all you have to do is contact us or Dr. Or Dr. Or Dr. Stanley McCarden or the CMEI and they'll do the needful for you. And believe me, this works. I've seen it in organizations. For instance, I worked in the Bangalore Baptist Hospital and I've seen, for instance, the memorial service they have a year afterwards where surviving, well, family members come and share their you know, experience. And I've seen people crying and weeping out of gratitude that the team at the hospital ensured an excellent quality of life towards the end for their loved one. Believe me, we actually take care and treat loved ones. We don't really take care of patients these days. We're trying to change the narrative there. So as I said, this is often the resting place of many people. And it's time you decided how you and I care for people in the future, not just in the medical field, and be cared for myself and yourself in the future. I hope we can make this difference. Now, I mentioned the still small voice that whispered to Elijah in the Old Testament. But believe me, God screams at you when you are in pain through a megaphone, right? So this pandemic and the lockdown and the global crisis is our call to action. And I think you're responding pretty well. But as a country, I think we need to do a lot more. I'm going to end this with a few Bible verses that I ran into today in my time of study and personal meditation. God actually is waiting and longing that we would actually look at our life in its comprehensiveness and completeness, especially the latter end. And you really have to address this with the fear of God. Only then do you get the holy understanding how to deal with this objectively. If we are flippant about it, if we believe this is not our business, if this is not going to happen to us, I think Jesus himself has warned us in the scriptures, you know. You and you alone will bear it. Yes, he has given us his assurance that if we believe we wasted our time, he will increase us in his mercy and his grace and give us a meaningful and rewarding and fulfilling life. But in case we face the eventuality of the end of our lives, he's still going to be there. Uh, you may find different versions of this verse, but I found this one is the most comforting one, that he's a God forever, even unto the end. And I think this graphic, which I found online, says it all. You know, at the end of the day, you and I don't need a philosophy, a worldview, a message, a card, someone's phone call. You need someone. You don't need a philosophy or a message. You need someone there. And he's there. He's waiting for you. Be of good cheer. He's there. Be not afraid. So to complete the circle, I think John 10.10 is a big favorite for many of us in the medical field. Um, it is one of the favorites of the Christian Medical Association of India and mine. And this is my reiteration this, today. It is our business, our 24-7 business, to respond to suffering. There's no greater motivation than him. His love compels us to act, to the suffering that is around us, and the 360 degree or even greater wholeness that is available in Jesus is uncomparable. And the biggest, biggest reassurance is that he's conquered death. He's been across that bridge and he's waiting for us. And that is the big undeniable hope that we have in him. Uh, this is a continuing journey and we seriously value your opinion. Uh, my contact information is there. Uh, please, as I 
uh, mentioned before, this is a work in progress. Uh, you need to go and check for facts because these can get updated and we are available for help and assistance.